Joining us now for more analysis on BlockFi, you guessed it right, is Howard Fisher, who is a partner at Moses Singer, but perhaps more interestingly, is also a former SEC senior trial counsel. Uh, it's good to have you, Howard. I want to dive straight into it. Uh, you know, you can take us through some of your key takeaways because Nick reflected on he, his key takeaways from the bankruptcy hearing yesterday. But please just help us understand this. BlockFi was an SEC success story. Where did they go wrong? Yeah, so, you know, it, it's very interesting to watch what's happening in the crypto world. Um, when I was at the SEC, we always hated any kind of settlement which didn't have immediate payment for precisely this reason is that there are credit risks for any settlement that a party is not going to pay. And clearly, you know, the block files, uh, filing that shows that it owes this much money to the SEC is going to be a concern to the SEC, and it's going to probably impact settlements going forward. So uh, exactly, we, we, the SEC, of course, uh, they get first priority, correct, in this whole, in this whole uh, bankruptcy? Yeah, I mean, and generally speaking, government creditors get first priority, and a bankruptcy proceeding uh, will help you wipe away or limit some of your private claims. However, it's not going to limit or wipe away the government claims. On the other hand, $30 million to the SEC is not that much money. Um, if the SEC doesn't get it, it's not going to be the worst thing in the world. The SEC, I think, is going to be a lot more concerned, not with the money from the settlement, but from what the BlockFi uh, bankruptcy represents, what it represents in terms of harm to investors, what it rep represents in terms of systemic risk, what it represents in terms of risks of contagion, and what it shows about the risks to crypto world in general. And I think that's going to be a little bit more to the front of the mind of the SEC than the $30 million that they're owed. So along those lines, that $30 million, if they were to take it and it meant that uh, creditors would not get paid, small retail investors not get paid, would the SEC look at it and say, well, you know what, uh, for the sake of the investing community, we would, we'll forego this penalty so that these small investors can get paid? Or do they want to send the message to, to the world that, hey, look, when you violate SEC laws, we don't care what happens to you. We'll destroy you. And this is proof. Now, look, uh, government regulators, the SEC included, are always very concerned with what the effects of their actions are. Uh, and, you know, it's been a criticism historically of, of the SEC that a lot of their enforcement actions damage institutions, which in fact damages the investors in those institutions, their shareholders, the people who work at those companies. So this is definitely going to be a concern. And given the amount that's at stake here, this, the issue of what the SEC is owed versus what so, investors are owed, what what uh, what customers are owed. I, I don't think that the SEC is going to be as aggressively pushing for its repayment uh, as it might be in another case. But in this case, though, it is a crypto company, and and it just seems very. It seems that the SEC is, uh, let's say, just more hostile to crypto than it is to other industries, and, and that it might want to kind of send the message home, particularly to the rest of crypto, that this is this is different. You, you've not wanted to be covered by the SEC, therefore you'll pay. It, 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 you don't think that's going to be a factor in, in how they decide to take their yeah. Uh, no, I I mean, I think that's a good question, but I think that it's not the fact that the SEC is hostile to crypto. It's that the SEC is skeptical about the protections that investors have in crypto world. They're skeptical of claims that coins are not securities, and they're skeptical about the risk management practices of crypto. So I, I think that the message that the SEC will want to send and has been trying to send is less about the sanctity of SEC settlements than how we go about about regulating a very young industry, which, as we see from the failure of FTX, has a lot of very young people running it, and make sure that they use the kind of metrics and management techniques that traditional legacy financial companies have been using. 
But I think that's more of the SEC's concern than sending a message to crypto world that their settlements are sacrosanct. They're much more concerned with sending a message that there needs to be regulation in this field. Uh, Howard, is, is there something that the SEC should have done differently in this case? Because, you know, the, the BlockFi fine is, is widely seen as kind of the SEC approach of regulation by enforcement, right? It was kind of like, okay, you know, here, com- coming in after the fact and saying like, okay, here's a fine. Um, should they have handled this differently? I know it's sort of a controversial opinion. Some people think yes, some people think no. Yeah, I mean, look, I think we're in an era where there is a gap between the regulation we have and the regulation that we need. And uh, the concern of Chairman Gensler and a lot of other people in the financial services regulatory apparatus is that the current regulatory structure isn't adequate to the task of dealing with crypto. Uh, And the fact that most crypto institutions are not regulated, they're not registered, and there's a lack lack of transparency in how they operate. That's not the case for legacy financial systems. And because of that lack of transparency, regulators don't have the opportunity to see what risk management systems they're using, how they use, how they use and treat customer assets, whether they segregate them properly, what their risk is in connection with other players in the market, and what their how connected their accounts are and their risks are with those of other crypto institutions. And I think that's why uh, even crypto, um, even those friendlier to crypto in the regulatory sphere are now calling for a look at more uh, sophisticated and uh, established crypto regulation in order to make sure that there are no more BlockFi's, no more FTX's, or or at very least you can never say that there's never going to be any problem, but what you can do is try to minimize those problems in advance. Yeah, I mean, what, what I find striking about this is we had a guest on yesterday who basically was like, BlockFi customers probably are never going to see their money again, which is sort of a crazy thing to think about, you know, in the United States. I mean, is, is there something that could have been done uh, on the part of regulators to address that? Like, I don't know, like, do we need an FDIC for crypto or something? I mean, it's just sort of this crazy concept that people can just deposit their money and then the company fails and they're like, all right, you know, sorry, see you later. I mean, that's that seems like a crazy situation to me. No, and I, I, I think it is crazy, and I think there are a lot of calls for regulation either by the CFTC, the SEC, or some other agency. Uh, I mean, it's sort of ironic, isn't it? Uh, crypto has pushed itself as free from government interference and free from government regulation, and now it turns out that, well, maybe some regulation is a good thing. I mean, if there was a central bank of crypto, which seems to be what Binance is trying to do, uh, is to create one run by them, of course, we wouldn't necessarily see the scope of problems that we're seeing today. Uh, If there was some kind of requirement that customer assets be segregated, I don't think we'd see this kind of risk of contagion. And if there was some kind of requirement for some kind of depository insurance, then customers would be assured of getting at least some portion of their deposits back. All right, uh, just a final question for you, uh, completely out of time, but BlockFi intends to file a motion to allow wallet customers to withdraw funds outside of the bankruptcy process. Wallet, obviously, in this case, being their version of a custodial product, we can assume that. Uh, What are the odds, (laughs) according to you, of that succeeding? I mean, that's a good question. I I think, you know, as uh, was pointed out just before, there only have been a few large bankruptcies, and this is the first one in the New Jersey courts. And New Jersey bankruptcy courts are excellent. Their staff there are excellent, and they're going to be taking very close, a very close look at these questions. But we're really operating in foreign waters here. Uh, No one knows really how to approach us, and there's going to be a lot of practice pragmatic analysis uh, and it's you know it's i don't want to hazard a guess as to what the ultimate outcome is going to be because usually when i do that i turn out to be 180 degrees wrong uh, but i do think that there's going to be a lot of very careful thinking on this by everybody